Evan Grubb has been fixing SaaS pricing for nearly 10 years, speaking to over 2,000 companies and counting. He quite literally spends his days talking monetization with everyone from your B2C darling to B2B behemoths. To top it off, he helped author The State of B2B SaaS Pricing in 2023. Although folks are definitely getting better about when they change their prices, there's still a massive knowledge gap on the best method to do so. Who better than Evan to talk us through it? Plus, we talk about the sneaky subscription company you've got to learn from, Costco. While they may seem like your run-of-the-mill legacy box store, they functionally pioneered the subscription model for over 40 years, slinging toilet paper, groceries, $1.50 hot dogs, and everything in between. We get into the details of what makes Costco's business model such a massive revenue driver, including over $4 billion of subscription revenue alone last year. If you want to improve your monetization strategy, you're going to have to listen to what Evan Grubb has to say. From Paddle, my name is Ben Hillman, and let's protect the hustle. So before we get into the episode, we've just got a quick word from our sponsor, us. More specifically, the Price Intelligently team. They're hosting a discussion about pricing featuring today's guest, Evan Grubb. He's going to be joined by Jack Cove, and the two of them are going to dive deep into pricing your AI product in 2024. The discussion will be on January 30th at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you'll hear in the episode, Evan is brilliant when it comes to this sort of stuff, and he and Jack back up their anecdotes with some really solid evidence, if I say so myself. You'll get a bunch of valuable insights like how to understand the value your AI tool or product adds to your customer, how this will likely lead to a more complex pricing structure and getting started with that, as well as best-in-class strategies that we have seen and worked with. Make it easy on yourself and sign up with a link in the description. And now, let's get into the episode. My name is Evan Grubb. I'm an account executive, and I sell the Price Intelligently service here at Paddle. Give me the Evan Grubb background. How did you get here? Um, how long have you been doing this, and like why? I've been with now Paddle, formerly Price Intelligently, as you know, Ben, for about seven years. It's my first job out of college, so I went to school in Boston at Emmanuel College down the street from you, and um, I, I met Peter, one of the co-founders, and I was essentially evaluating going to get my MBA and some other gigs, and had a really interesting chat with him. And he basically said like, you can go get your MBA or you can come work for this startup and you can learn probably a lot about business in doing so. So I did that. We were we were pretty small. As you know, Ben, we we bootstrapped this thing for a long time. And the, the challenges that we were solving for, for companies were like really interesting, right? We weren't slinging software uh, in a transactional way. I wasn't cold calling a ton of people every day. I was solving these real business problems with regard to pricing and packaging and go to market motions for what is now we know is like a, a booming sector, the SaaS and subscription industry. Uh, but at the time it was, it was still kind of in the infancy. I started doing that. Um, I've basically been on that team for about seven years. The core mission of helping SaaS companies better monetize their products has remained the same, but like the way that we've gone to market and the way we've evolved the team is, has changed. So um, it's remained pretty sweet over the past seven years. And why continue to do this? I know um, you have a background in music. I saw you, one of your like, I th it looks like in college, maybe you're like Blink Music, you were working there. Yeah, that's like, I know that's a side passion of yours. You once told me that the Eagles are the most consistent American rock band of all time. And that has truly stuck with me for so long. Wow. Like, did you want to back that up at all? Let's go on a little tangent. <laughs> I think it's a shorter list than people realize of great American rock bands. I think it's Eagles number one. Not necessarily my favorite, I'm just sure. saying like great bands. Like it's Eagles number one and probably Beach Boys number two. Maybe Nirvana number three. But the point is like, we actually don't have that many great American rock bands and it's kind of ironic. But anyway, that, that was, it's interesting that you remember that because you and I have, we've definitely jammed out a little bit over the years. But yeah, I, so I worked for a music studio when I was in college that also sold like high-end audio equipment. So it's like really nice speakers and amps and cables and things. And that's when I realized like I probably could sell a little bit, but it had to be a product that I was passionate about and could fully wrap my head around. Uh, I think my, my dumb brain can't fully understand the inner workings of high-end audio. And so I was really, really bad at it, but I learned a lot and I... That team there was awesome to me. And so, you still, do you still uh, play uh, guitar on the side? Yeah, I still play guitar. I still play some drums. Wish I was better at piano. I never really cracked the code on that one. But yeah, guitar is kind of the go-to for me. 
Nice, man. Yeah, it's good to have that. I, I, I definitely understand the, um, you know, having that off the, on the side as something that you, you know, maybe could pursue if you wanted to like, I don't know, monetize your hobby, but it's good to have that sort of side thing that you can do to unwind. Um, and when you're just to not think about pricing and packaging and all that, like 24 seven, you know, as we've talked about over the past seven years, I've known you, you've kind of ra- rose, rose to the ranks from like BDR to account executive. You've been doing this for so long, like seven years, you know, closer to 10 than five. Uh, what has been the through line that sort of kept you interested in this and, and gets you excited to keep going? I think it's a really interesting space. Like the subscription model is one of the greatest business models of all time. And then you stack on top of that, like software where margins are super high. And so you're, you're it's this emergence of a lot of factors that make for a really exciting space and pricing sort of touches all of those dynamics. Right. So my job is basically helping software companies that are already doing really, really well, just like sort of get to the next level. And so a lot of folks think that that's changing the price point or it's moving up or down market, but there's a ton within that umbrella. Right. So it's like, are we targeting the right types of buyer personas? Uh, are we charging on the right value metrics? Do we have the right model right now? It's like usage pricing. Should it be pay as you go? Should it be this kind of hybrid model? And so the questions change. And so you're right, like I've been doing this for a long time, but it's like, it's never the same. Every company is a little bit different. The goals change, uh, the markets change, like this year is different than it was last year. Uh, so it, it does feel fresh, even though I've been doing it for a while. How many companies do you think you've talked to over the years, if you can ballpark that? I think we we looked it up and it was like 2000 or something. You've talked to 2000 companies. Lot. Yeah. that's. Unreal. What are like the the common objections to folks on like, oh, well, we don't want to change. Like, we don't want to mess with our pricing. Like, is that, is that a common thing that you've heard over the years? There's a couple, like why folks just don't want to make pricing right. changes. Yeah. You mean? yeah. Yeah. It's usually like it's been working. So if it's not broken, we don't want to fix it. There's the, we're looking at our competitors. And so we know if folks are buying our competitors, then, uh, then we should have a pretty good read on what they care about. Uh, but I don't know, everybody's a little bit different. Like sometimes it's like, Hey, we have a, we have a new board member and they worked for, you know, they worked in this industry for 20 years. And so the, we're going to go with their direction. It's actually a little more, uh, political or involving guesswork than you might imagine. Before we move on though, I wanted to know how frequently do you think you talk to folks about pricing? Like every, is that just like, that's literally your job. Every single day you're talking to folks about pricing. I talk to folks about pricing every day. Yeah. Multiple times a day. You have the not like you just know what people are thinking about and what the sort of like trends are. Is there some way like you can keep track of all this? This is why I started my newsletter initially is because I felt like I was on the ground floor of a lot of these like early trends because I hear the questions from different founders and operators within SaaS companies. And I was like, I don't know if anybody's actually documenting things like should, you know, different companies move to usage pricing or should they change their packaging or how do we approach bundling? And so I just wanted to like sort of document the the trends and then literally ask the questions and try to answer them uh, with other people in the community. So that's initially why I started the community, which led me uh, to writing about the company that we're going to talk about today. Before we get into that, though, I definitely want to talk about state of B2B SaaS pricing report. That came out a couple of months ago. And I know, well, first of all, you had a little bit of involvement with that. I know you did a talk with Andrew Davies, our CMO um, at SaaStock, was it? Or or a conference somewhere. But yeah. Tell me a little bit about the state of SaaS uh, pricing report. So Sanji and Sarah on our pricing team led the effort here. And basically, they went after a a lot of SaaS companies and and asked them questions about how they approach pricing. And so the, the idea was like, we can get a pretty good grasp on what companies are doing. We can start to see some of the trends and then maybe see like what's working and what's not working so well. So it was a pretty interesting study uh, with some good findings for hopefully everybody that checks it out. And one of those big findings that we found is that almost 70% of the folks that we surveyed uh, said that they were making pricing changes semi-annually or even more frequently. That's fantastic because I know over the past like 10 years at Price Intelligently, we've been telling folks like change your prices frequently. So it sounds like folks are 
now changing their prices more frequently, as we've been suggesting. But what's next? Like, what's what's the next step? That what are we trying to get folks um, to approach uh, pricing changes the right way? How how are we doing that? Probably just not screwing it up. <laughs> like there, <laughs> like when we started doing this, Ben, you and me, six or seven years ago, we were trying to educate people on the importance of pricing and packaging. Right. That is no longer necessary. Like it seems like everybody understands that pricing is is probably the the most impactful growth lever you can pull from within a subscription business. The next step though, is making sure that you're not rowing in the wrong direction by making mistakes. Right. So I think that was one of the takeaways from the state of SaaS report. It's like companies are making changes on a regular basis to both pricing and packaging, but they might not be totally aligned with value and their strategies. So is pricing totally aligned with the elasticity of your buyers or are you, are you still giving away too many features and entry level plans or are you properly creating these expansion paths to boost NDR. Like those are the, it's almost like we've, we've shifted from the importance of the strategy to the importance of the tactics in some ways. Um, so that I see that as sort of the next evolution of pricing within the, the SaaS community. And and on those tactics, or I guess this is more strategy, feel free to correct me here, but we've seen that it's roughly in, in our survey found that it's like roughly a three-way split between folks that are making pricing changes based on competitors cost plus and value-based pricing. So what's wrong with this split? And without bearing the lead, like, why should we be focused more on value-based pricing? Yeah, you're kind of leading the witness. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm making it easy on you. Cost plus in SaaS doesn't make a ton of sense unless we're talking about infrastructure companies or in some ways AI. We can talk about like how AI is changing pricing a little bit. Competitive-based pricing tends to fail for a couple of reasons. What is you've hopefully built a different product than your competitors and thus you probably shouldn't uh, charge the same way that they do. Um, and the second is with the sort of presumption with competitive based pricing is that your competitors have done their homework and that they're doing it right. And they probably aren't given some of the, the data that we've checked out. So we tend to think that the best approach is this value-based strategy. So aligning price with the value description of your end buyers, which by the way, I think most of us would agree with but again, I, I think a lot of us don't totally know how to uh, collect the data and action it and create a, a true value-based strategy. And I mean, let's just go a little bit deeper on that. The, like, sure, we know there's like, we've got plenty of resources on the price intelligently side, on the paddle side that like go more in depth in this. But uh, for the folks that are listening that might want to know more about value-based pricing, like where do you start? What are you, what are you trying to figure out? with value-based pricing? There's a couple of things. Um, one is just like talking to existing customers and prospective buyers. So make sure that you know where they're seeing value and, and you can segment those customers in different ways. So um, the other piece is defining the outcomes that you're shooting for. So if you're trying to create this sort of PLG land and expand motion, like your value-based pricing strategy starts within the the entry level tiers. Like what are the features that you have to give away up front to to let somebody realize value up front and then know their buyer path so that once they move on to a new tier, there's this sort of natural expansion over time. Versus if you're an enterprise company, value-based pricing is understanding like what are the uh, optimal price bands or the windows of pricing you can play around with for larger companies and how many users they need and how many features they need, et cetera. For sure. That's not a perfect answer. No, no. I, I mean, it's a complex like it's not as simple. I mean, it is simple. It's like, you know, just align your pricing to the value that you're providing. That's the thing that we've all, always preached. And it's still true to this day. Pretty hard to like debate that fact. But I think what, what we're kind of elucidating here is that it's like, it is a simple like idea and concept to like get behind, but the actual going into it requires a lot of legwork and requires a lot of what you're talking about, like talking to your customers and finding out what they're Willingness to pay data is, you know, what their, what the value value props are. Finding finding out all that sort of stuff is, again, simple in like concept, but actually going out and doing it just it's a lot of work, you know. And that's where, not to sell, not to make your job easier, but that that's where our value really comes from on the price intelligently side. It's tough to do, but um, it's not rocket science. Like it's understanding how buyers behave, their willingness to pay, what features they care about. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. And I've always been fascinated by, you know, we say we're we're not preaching here to raise your prices 
like. Like that's not what this is really about. It's about finding the real optimal price point for your buyers. And so I'm curious, in your years of experience talking to all these companies, have you seen a company like, I, I think I know what this looks like, but have you seen a company actually lower their prices as part of their like new pricing strategy? Definitely. Yeah. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying before on outcomes. Like if we strip away ARR as the target outcome, because that's what everybody wants is more money. There's usually like these different metrics that companies are shooting for, like North Star metrics. And sometimes they're not super clear. And so it's worth defining those before going into any sort of pricing exercise. But sometimes they are really clear. And so for a company that's shooting for logo acquisition, NDR and ARPU growth, like sometimes decreasing pricing on your entry level plan can be really, really effective because you lower the barrier to entry. It increases the funnel of paid customers, at least in the entry level tier. And if you do your homework, you might find out that there's an expansion path to improve NDR because once they're a paid customer, they realize the value and they increase over time. And that too begets higher ARPU and ARPA. So it definitely shakes out that way where lowering price can actually help you in the long run. And would that also look like, because what where I thought it would make sense is introducing a new tier potentially, whether that's a freemium tier or just a more basic plan that like, obviously all companies are different, but like in some instances it probably is like, oh, well, there's actually opportunity here to you know, provide this value to customers that maybe aren't at this next point. And if we introduce this lower tier freemium or or whatever, there's that as well. And am I correct in in that assumption? Yeah, you're you're definitely correct. I would also caution that sometimes, like there's a flip side of the coin where I think a lot of SaaS companies will give away too much functionality upfront in a freemium tier or an entry level paid tier. It actually cannibalizes the expansion path. So it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword where Again, and this is where I go back to like defining the outcomes, where if you're really focused on logo acquisition, it might be a, a good strategy for you. But if you're focused on ARPA or ARPU growth exclusively, it could actually hurt you because it's cannibalizing the, the revenue that you would otherwise get. I think that's a perfect segue to get into our featured presentation for this, for this episode, Costco. The reason we're talking to you today, Evan, is that you wrote a uh, piece, including a lot of data that we got from, I think, from the ProfitWell side of things and doing some surveys, finding some willingness to pay data around Costco. And specifically, I know it's titled the 40-year-old subscription, I believe is the name, if I'm going off of memory. Yeah. So I I could gush for days on uh, on this business. Talk to me just a little bit about Costco and how there's this like secret subscription company that we don't really talk about that element. Are, are you a Costco member? I am. I, uh, I have a little story about that that I'll get into a little bit later, but yes. Okay. So I was not for a long time and my fiance's mom uh, works for Costco and she's worked for Costco for a long time. And so when I, when I met her, it kind of seemed like Every time I was with her, we started talking about Costco. <laughs> and that kind of led me down a rabbit hole because she was singing Costco's praises. And I just started like reading about Costco and uh, eventually like got into the 10Ks and like reading the investor reports and stuff. And that's when I was like, this is a pretty outstanding business. I know it's not a hot take, but it's, I was like, this is a, this is a pretty insane business model uh, because they do so many things. Like if you evaluate it, what's crazy about Costco is if you evaluated them as a a retail company, like they're fantastic. But if you also evaluated them as a subscription company, they're insane, right? Like they're they're making four something billion dollars off of just subscriptions from from the memberships, uh, which accounts for like seventy percent of their profit. And in a time where like going to the store to buy things is at an all time low, Costco is outpacing the S and P five hundred. It's, it's an insane story. So. Um, I'm just like super fascinated by that. Yeah, no, that's interesting you bring up. So your fiance's mom works for Costco. I think the employee retention, it's like something something crazy. Like people work for Costco and then they just don't really, I think it's like their average tenure is like 10 yeah. years or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. One, they pay their employees way more than their competitors, which, which helps. Um, they also have really good benefits, which I think goes a long way for uh, people that the leaders of their household and then I, I, I want to say it, like the brand of Costco is just like super valuable to employees. Like they get equity, they believe in the mission 
Uh, it's not all about the products that they sell, but it's about the whole Costco ethos. So I think that goes a long way. So I want to read off their, um, their code of ethics here for you. In order to achieve our mission, we will conduct our business with the following code of ethics in mind. Obey the law, take care of our members, take care of our employees, respect our suppliers. And I know that a big thing that's missing from there is like, well, what does that mean like for the ultimate goal of like making money? Like that's nowhere in here. Yes, it's a code of ethics, but they say the next sentence there is if we do these four things throughout our organization, then we will achieve our ultimate goal, which is to reward our shareholders. So it's interesting looking at that and it's like they are ultimately thinking about like making money and being a profitable business, but it's like establishing this like foundational system that allows them to do that. So that like making money is almost an afterthought in their mind where it's like, if we just focus on the customer and we focus on our members, it's like, that's what we're kind of always preaching at Price Intelligence has felt like. It's like, what do your customers want? Like that's, that's what we're trying to do in my view, when it comes to like pricing and packaging. Yeah, that's kind of the dream state scenario. I don't know how many companies could could say that that's the case, but they clearly, the shareholder value is, is clearly secondary and it's almost an outcome of their operating principles, which is pretty awesome. I'd love to get into the membership model, but you and I have talked a little bit offline about this, about how we can't just look at them as a subscription company, and we can't just look at them as a retail company. The membership subscription is basically a key to the club. And this is something that like we, there are subscriptions everywhere now, and sometimes they're super aligned to value. Sometimes they're just a piece of the equation. Costco does it right because the subscription one, it, it gets you access to the club, but it's also leaning into this, what's called the sunk cost fallacy. So when you walk into Costco, you know that you're, you're already paying $60 or $120 a month, whatever it is. And so you think like, hey, I might as well just try to go for the best deal. I, I sort of have to buy a couple things to justify the cost of this membership. And they have the deals on a lot of things that you wouldn't see otherwise. So it's a really brilliant model. And then on top of that, they have add-ons for everything. It's like, if you want to travel, if you want to purchase an engagement ring, whatever it is, like you can get that obviously through through Costco. So they capitalize really nicely on, on that piece. I know you and I talked about the price points of the membership. Like, why don't they just increase the price? So we can talk about that too. But I think it's it's an awesome model for them. If we look at the membership, the pricing page here for Costco, uh, we can see that there are two main plans. They also have the business membership plan. Specifically look at the consumer side. You can get the Gold Star member for $60 a year or the executive member for $120 a year. And just from like doing so many episodes of Pricing Page Teardown, I can see that it's like, oh, they're putting like the tier that they want you to get on the left-hand side. Like they're putting the like 120. It's like, that's the first one you're going to see. You can see there's a whole bunch of attention there of best value and exclusive benefits. $60 and $120. I don't, we don't know, we don't have insight into how they got to these price points. Do you think that Costco would benefit from like a value-based pricing approach? Not necessarily because they are a retail company. They're a cost plus company, right? They, they, part of their mission is they say, literally, we're not going to upgrade or upcharge these products more than something like 14%. So they will never be a value-based pricing strategy like a SaaS company, but with the memberships, they probably could increase price on the base plan. Like they're at 60 bucks. That could probably be like 80 bucks and they would still be okay. And the 120 could probably be like 150. I Like don't hold me to that, but they, they probably do have room to raise prices because they haven't done it in a long time. And it sounds like from what I've read, there may be one, there may be a price increase on the horizon. That said, I think Costco is really, really focused on retention. Like I think we're, if we go to their North Star metrics, I would guess that they're more focused on retention than they are on the revenue, just the revenue from memberships, because it's so hard to keep consumers like uh, from a retention standpoint on subscriptions and they retain 90% of their consumers today. So I think they're really focused on that piece. And then they upsell through these other categories, be it the groceries or the engagement rings or travel plans, things like that. So, um, yeah, but but I do think there's room to increase price. So I know you mentioned their the the like upgrade like 
Uh, they're not really trying to get you to upgrade actively. However, I did have a really like fun thing that happened to me a couple weeks ago where they got me to upgrade to their executive plan in checkout. So the way it kind of looked is I, I basically do all my shopping at Costco. Uh, I kind of go like, I'd say probably around once a month to get, you know, toilet paper, all that sort of stuff, <laughs> like the groceries. Ga- I get all my gas from Costco. It's the cheapest place to get gas. And I was in the checkout and uh, they like, I forget if it was, there was like a, a, a signal or a notification or something that they got. And someone was flagged over and an associate came over and approached me and was like, hey, so you're spending enough at Costco that like it would make a lot of sense for you to upgrade to the executive plan. You get, I think it's like 2% cash back in the form of like a check that you get at the end of the year. You don't need to get a new card. You don't need to like, you know, do anything else. All you have to do is like say yes and we will upgrade you. And that's what I was just like, well, yeah, like sure. And so I thought it was fascinating that it's like they are actually trying to get people to that higher tier, but it's tied directly to the value. It's tied like it in a way they are thinking from like the value first perspective where I am agreeing to give them that that extra amount. Like, you know, I, and I think it was on top of all it was like instead of paying up 120, it was like, no, you just pay the difference between model. And it was just like the upgrade experience. They are obviously benefiting from this, but it didn't feel like I was being like sold to when that happened. It was just like a no brainer for me to do it. Well, that's a pretty telltale sign of value based pricing or like effective value based pricing. So I like that's great. The other piece here is kind of the elephant in the room, which is their add on strategy. Like they will get you with a membership price and maybe they'll upgrade you to a higher membership price, but they also have like a million add ons. Right, so you can purchase anything you want basically through the Costco ecosystem. You mentioned gas, like that's a great one where that keeps you driving into the parking lot and then you can go back into the store. So that's a big piece to this too. It's like they'll they'll crush it from a, a subscription standpoint through the memberships, but they also have like a whole myriad of add-ons that they can use, which by the way, is a good takeaway for SaaS companies. Like this is a, a very underutilized aspect of SaaS pricing, I think. Yeah, tell me more about the, I know you have a whole section in your article, you talk about add-ons and how like, this is this is like truly a concept that a SaaS company can take and like a copy, if you will. I think a lot of SaaS companies should leverage add-ons more. The idea of some features being low, what we call low relative preference or most of your audience not really needing those features, but those that want them have a high willingness to pay. They basically should be sold a la carte. They should be removed from your tiers. So Costco does this through the add-ons that we talked about. But if you're a SaaS company and there's a feature that you're giving away for free or in an entry-level tier that 20 or 30% of your audience realistically needs, then you're actually cannibalizing expansionary revenue by not removing it and selling it a la carte. And then the other thing is might hurt you from a retention standpoint if you're giving those features away up front because somebody might sign up and they go, why the heck am I paying for this tier when I'm using 40% of the features, for example? So it's a win-win if, when you identify those features. Right. It's it's almost like they have this, like, if you were to apply this to a subscription company, it's like there's these there's just two tiers, but like almost everything outside of paying the membership is an add-on. You like, I would almost argue that like even just buying groceries is an add-on. Like, like they're basically yeah. an all add-on company, if you will. Yeah, that's a good point. They pretty much are. There's a specific add-on that I would love to talk about. Um, it's near and dear to my heart, and that is the hot dog. A dollar fifty for a twenty-ounce fountain drink and a Costco hot dog. Everyone always talks about how Jim Senegal, the founder, uh, talked to the CEO of Costco. Uh, you have this in your article, and uh, he was saying, like, man, like Jim, we're getting we're getting killed on the hot dog here. Like, it might make sense to like raise prices. And Jim Senegal has said multiple times, like, if you raise the price of the hot dog, I will effing kill you. You wrote about this phenomenon. Why do you think that this deal has remained unchanged for the last 40 years and potentially it could remain unchanged for the next 40 years? Because it's not about the hot dog. It's about the brand, right? It was never about the hot dog then. You know this. The thing about this is it's almost become like legend or like Costco lore where it's like, now they really can't change the price of the hot dog. I have no idea if that conversation actually happened, but it would be a brilliant PR move if it was just like made up and they just told the world that it happened. Because that, I don't know how many people really eat the hot dog, but they know 
that that's a fundamental mission of the company is to keep prices low. So it's like the story tells you so much more about Costco's ethos and about their mission and their brand than the price of the hot dog itself ever would. And that's you, you've said as much in uh, your article that Costco's prices are their brand. Why is it that that is the case? Like it, it seems like they should never change their prices ever, maybe? Well, the prices of their goods are their brand. Right, like they will, they cap the markup for certain get goods at fourteen ish percent, sometimes eleven percent. So that is definitely part of their brand. And like their inception was a company that I'm forgetting the name oh, on. Oh, uh, that was basically FedMart. FedMart was started by Saul Price in the '50s, and Jim Senegal like worked there and like stole everything basically from Saul Price. Uh, and then the and then Price Club happened, and they ended up buying. Price Club. Price Club. Yep. That's what I was thinking yep. of. Yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You know more than I do. <laughs> um, but that like that was their their founding mission is to be like the cost uh, saving option for consumers. So th- it makes sense that that's a big piece of their brand. On the membership side, we've talked about it probably enough, but I see that like the price of the memberships being a little bit removed from the brand. Like they, they have some room probably to increase price. Not only has the price stayed the same, but the hot dog is now, I think- 10 or 20 percent bigger and in the original deal it was a 12 ounce can of soda and now you get a 20 ounce fountain drink that's like with unlimited refills so not only has the price stayed the exact same the deal has actually gotten even better and you get an even more like bang for your buck and i think that that just elucidates that like what we're talking about here is that it's like that is the costco brand is that like we're going to continue to offer you this like really great deal and we're gonna try as hard as we can to make this like as good as possible. Pretty much, it very well could be a loss leader for them. I don't know. Like, we don't know. I have to imagine. That, so, yeah. I've I've done a whole bunch of research trying to find out like is this actually a loss leader? And I think the closest I've gotten to is Jim Senegal said at one point like we're not like actually losing. He has. It's, they've been very cagey, but it's like I know that they do all like they have factories like for the Costco hot dog themselves. It's like completely like almost vertically integrated. It's not clear if it is a loss leader, but like assuming that it is, I think it's a really good loss leader for them to just sort of that advertisement right when you enter the store, $1. fifty for a hot dog. Holy crap. That's a good deal. 100%. We did some research uh, a while ago on willingness to pay and we found that the there's a positive association with a brand can swing willingness to pay up to 60%. And it sounds like you're saying that like, it seems like maybe there might be, we don't know Costco, we don't, we don't see into them, but if they were to change their prices, even to your, to your point of like, okay, they raised it, let's say $80 for the basic uh, and 150 for the executive, that that might have a negative perception and, and potentially hurt them from the membership standpoint, like maybe hurt their numbers there. Maybe they shouldn't raise their prices like like too much because it might hurt them. Well, this is tricky because when we talk about brand for B2B SaaS companies, oftentimes pricing or like being an inexpensive provider is not a core pillar of one's brand. So I, I almost like want to separate those two a little bit. For Costco, it's so like it's literally in the name. Like they are the low cost provider for groceries and and for retail consumers. That said, I think that if they keep their goods pricing below 14%, they can still increase their membership pricing. And the reason is people still love that brand. Like they they appreciate the cap on the prices for the goods and thus they probably ironically have a higher willingness to pay for the membership itself. You mentioned the the pricing change that they've said I think September of 2023 that they were considering another pricing change. Which makes sense because it's been documented that like roughly every five years they raise their price their the price of the membership five dollars. And I did some like crude math where you know, I'm not a data scientist. Don't quote me on any of this stuff. Um, but I basically found that if you adjust their prices for inflation, it is cheaper today. Similar to the hot dog, it's cheaper today to have a Costco membership at sixty dollars uh, a year when it was twenty five dollars. Uh, a year in 1983. If you adjust for inflation, it's like that $25 is actually like $77. So even if they were to raise their prices $5, which I'm almost certain that that is what they're going to do when they raise their prices, it's still going to be cheaper than it was. It's like the deal has gotten even better. That is pretty nuts. 
but that goes back to the brand. Right. Like their brand is keeping prices fairly low. And so if they think that they value the brand and the retention of their their customers over the bottom line in some cases or marginal impact to the bottom line, then it actually makes a ton of sense for them. And you've said as much in like uh, your article that everyone should aspire to have like a 40 year, you know, brand like that people love. Um, but if we get into like sort of the tactical, what folks can actually learn from this who are running their own SaaS company, how do we learn? Is it is it just like, is the add-ons the only thing we can really take away here? Is there is there something else that folks can learn? I think there's a couple things we can learn from Costco. We can learn that having a, a really solid brand is pretty much always valuable when it comes to pricing. We know that willingness to pay is higher for companies that their customers have a higher uh, approval rating of them. Uh, the second thing is add-ons. We know that if if you have a successful add-on strategy, you're able to extract more revenue from your your buyers, and it helps you from a retention standpoint. Uh, the third thing is virality is really really impactful for Costco, but also for a lot of these B2B companies moving more into PLG or product-led growth. So companies like Calendly, right? When you click, when you schedule on somebody's Calendly to book a time, it tells you that it's powered by Calendly. Or when you take a survey from Typeform. It tells you like, hey, this was powered by Typeform. That is, that's a way of creating sort of a viral growth strategy for B two B SaaS companies. So that's something that Costco does well. That um, I think we can take away for for the B two B community. I didn't see too much about the referral elsewhere other than your article. You said there's like that referral program. I don't know if it makes yeah. sense to touch on that. The other thing on virality is having like a, a good referral motion that Costco does really well. You, you mentioned like the upsell motion. The other the other piece would be the, the referral piece. There's a good write-up. I'm going to butcher it, but there's a good write-up by Kyle Poyer at OpenView. And he talked about this. He, he talked about like the, the value of having really strong customers that can refer you leads. And it's this sort of low CAC uh, acquisition play. So that that's another one that I think Costco does well that we could take away for for the B2B community. But otherwise, I, like we talked about from the jump, they're they're an amazing retail company. They're also an amazing subscription company. They're going to continue, I assume, to make changes. Uh, and so it's not a stretch to, to look to Costco for, for learnings for a lot of us in SaaS. It seems like most companies could probably raise their prices and that would like just be a good start. But for the most part, Pricing changes are that sort of long tail effect. Uh, and much like Costco, it's like they've been around for 40 years. Like they've established this brand for 40 years. They've worked on this, vi- like v- their viral growth, if you will, hasn't been like an overnight thing. It's been this, this, this thing that they've worked on from going back to those code of ethics, like, uh, that they've, they've been working on from the get go, from before Costco was even like, an idea back in the in the FedMart days with Soul Price and, and FedMart and Price Club and all that. So I feel like the lesson from Costco is really just the these things take time. Like it, it's it's not just like there's no quick hack that one company can do that's just going to fix their pricing or fix their company problems overnight. I totally agree. I think most companies probably could increase their pricing. A lot of a lot of companies we see are are underpriced. But it is, it's a journey, right? Like pricing is one aspect of a monetization strategy. We've talked about packaging or the add-ons, the the pricing model itself. Like how are you charging customers? Is on a uh, per user basis, on an AI token or credit basis, et cetera. And then also who are you targeting? Like who are the buyer personas that um, are a good fit for your product versus who are the folks that you shouldn't waste your time on targeting? Like all of this stuff goes into the monetization strategy I think too often we look at just the price point and assume that we have to get that piece right when in reality, it's a much bigger puzzle. So you talked in your article about bucking the status quo and how Costco's kind of differentiated themselves in a very commoditized market. Things like vowing to never exceed 14%, uh, free returns on all the products, free samples, and how companies like Slack, Zoom, Zendesk did this with software. How can one, just getting as specific as we possibly can, uh, without being able to see into the folks that are listening to this as companies, how do you learn from those examples? Like, what what is like bucking the strat- status quo really like look like on a individual basis? Well, I I can speak to this from a monetization standpoint, from a product building standpoint. I'm a dummy. I think there's a there's a question also about like how do we buck the status quo, and then also how do we justify making pricing changes right now when it's like a really hard time to 
to increase pricing for customers. And it's a hard time to land B2B customers. At the foundation of this is, is probably thinking from first principles of what, about what buyers care about and, and what they value. And I know that sounds like super cliche, but for example, if you, if you look at Zendesk or if you look at com- companies in the customer service space, for a long time, they've charged on a per agent or a per user basis. But we see now with with the, the uh, with AI and with the productivity of users that AI is able to generate, charging on a per user basis is diminishing, right? Because we probably have fewer agents and they're able to be more productive. So in reality, you can think more from first principles and get an idea that, hey, if we're charging on value, we're actually monetizing the number of happy customers or conversations completed at a successful outcome. And so that's the kind of thinking that I'm super interested in is like, how do we change these monetization models that have been around for a long time uh, with the introduction of technology and some market changes and trends and adjust them so that they're more aligned with value? This stuff is not rocket science, as you said, to borrow your phrase, uh, but it does take a lot of, you know, patience and and working at it and, and slowly, slowly changing the direction of the ship just ever so slightly. Well, cool, Evan, thank you so much for uh, coming on. What, uh, where can people find you? Is there a, a good plug for you to plug at this point? Yes, yeah, so you can check out my newsletter, evangrub.substack.com. It's called Notes from the Pricing Underground. Uh, otherwise, you can hit me up on LinkedIn or, or shoot me an email, evan.grub at paddle.com and happy to chat about pricing. But thanks for having me on, man. Of course, and that's uh, E-V-A-N-G-R-U-B-B, correct? Yep. Awesome. Thanks so much, Evan.